So the title of our new paper in eCancer was Cancer Treatment in the Last Six Months of Life When Inaction Can Outperform Action. This paper we wrote uh, because I saw a number of patients who were being treated until the very end of their life. And these were the patients who were supposed to be with their families and uh, they were supposed to be receiving palliative care, but for some reason they were receiving active treatments with chemotherapies and stuff until the very end of their life. Uh, which, uh, as an oncology community, we have already agreed that no cancer patient should be receiving uh, this active uh, toxic therapies at the very end of their life. And we even talk about a new metric called uh, chemo free. Uh, or hospital-free uh, duration towards the end of life. Uh, so uh, it came to uh, our mind that uh, why is this happening? So we wanted to explore on that. Why are cancer patients being actively treated until the very end of life when we know that chemotherapy is going to be futile and the patient is not going to benefit, but still why are we uh, doing that? So uh, during our review, we came up with uh, a, uh, a couple of explanations for that. Uh, one is because we don't know, um, we don't know how to predict prognosis very well. So we actually do not know uh, when the patient is going to die. So we are very optimistic. We tend to be optimistic, and research has shown that both physicians and patients they tend to be uh, unrealistically optimistic about the uh, beneficial effects of treatment as well as the prognosis of the disease. So we tend to uh, believe in the efficacy side of the drug and we downplay the toxicities aspect of the drug. Uh, so we keep in giving the drug. Uh, that is one aspect. But the other is a very practical aspect in which it's very difficult for the physician to convey to the patient that they don't have anything to do. Uh, in terms of active treatment, of course, there is always palliative care and supportive care that you can do for the patient, and which is very meaningful. But in terms of treating the cancer disease itself, uh, it's very hard to convey to the patient as a physician that uh, there are no options left. Uh, and, and the other, other stigma about palliative care is palliative care, when the patient hears the word palliative care, he equals that to uh, the doctor abandoning his responsibility and the patient being on the verge of death. But that's, not all, but that's definitely not the case because palliative care is not a doctor abandoning his or her responsibility. It's a doctor being more responsible to the patient and treating the patient in a more responsible way so that the patient does not have uh, uh, toxicities. And the patient has a very peaceful, what uh, in that paper we call about peaceful life death transition. Maybe it's not a very good word, but uh, still, um, I believe that is another key factor that we need to keep in mind while treating the patient because we are talking about quality of life, uh, but what about quality of life death transition? Because these are the last few moments a patient has and the patient wants to spend that time without having a lot of IV treatments, uh, uh, injections going on in his body without having to suffer the side effects of the treatment and he wants to spend that time with his friends and families, he or she. Uh, so we need to uh, keep this in mind while treating a patient. And the other, other important uh, finding of our paper was uh, then we looked after the cancer drug approvals from the FDA uh, in last five years and we found like there were three drugs that were approved uh, but they had a median of overall survival of around only six months. Uh, so this was a bit shocking to us because, uh, yeah, there are a lot of papers that talk about OS benefit with the drug, but we are not talking about OS benefit. We are not talking about how much of difference between the control and the drug, but we are talking about the whole survival with the drug. And the total survival of the drug is only around six months. So we agree on one hand that a patient in the last six months of life should not be receiving active cancer treatment. And we also approve drugs that provide a survival of only around six months. And that is, if you compare with the placebo arm or the comparator arm, uh, in the comparator arm or the placebo arm, the patient still has four months of survival. So it is four months of chemo-free life versus six months of chemo-laden life. Uh, so uh, we point out that uh, uh, the regulatory authorities should also take this matter into account. And if we agree that no patient should be receiving active cancer treatment towards the very end of their life, in the last six months of their life, then we should also not approve the drugs that don't provide a survival of more than six months. 
Has there been any feedback to this from palliative care organizations? Uh, yeah, there have been a lot of feedback, especially on social media, from a lot of um, physicians who shared our emotions and who shared our experiences. And they keep, uh, they tell us that they have also seen a lot of such examples that are happening in their own setting. So irrespective of high income country or low income country, patients everywhere, uh, they are uh, receiving active treatments until the very end of their life and there are a lot of uh, uh, palliative care physicians who are trying to, uh, uh, who are very supportive of our work and who are saying that this paper should form the basis of uh, a new curriculum in teaching medical oncologists, uh, in training medical oncologists that, uh, because we are training medical oncologists only on treatments like if a patient has gastric cancer, you should do this on the first line treatment, second line treatment this, third line treatment this, but nobody talks about how to convey uh, bad news to the patient and how to negotiate with the patient about treatment goals. Uh, and these skills are as much of, uh, should as much be a part of medical, tra medical oncology training as uh, the treatment uh, schedules and regimens itself. Some authors or columnists have also, uh, based on our paper, they have also written some columns in uh, newspapers in the country, uh, which uh, was very touching to us because uh, our main uh, intention in writing the paper was to uh, stimulate a discussion because this is this is supposed to be a taboo topic to talk about death and to talk about uh, uh, life death transition of a cancer patient but uh, but this was very important topic uh, so there have been a lot of discussions going on and people are starting to talk about it so I think uh, we have achieved our goal in that sense that people are now talking about uh, whether or not to treat the patient towards the very end of life and uh, what are the patient's goals at the end of life and how best to mm, help a patient in that uh, life death transition journey treat the patient and not just the disease. Exactly. Has there been any feedback from patients, advocates, families about their own perspective on the end of their life or the end of lives that they have seen and for the patients that they have worked with balancing that, like you say, six months of chemo-laden life or four months of chemo-free? Yeah, there have been a lot of feedback from the patients and patient advocates side too. Uh, and the feedback are basically uh, two, uh, if we have to group them. One is uh, they agree with the paper and uh, they share their experiences and they say like uh, why is this happening uh, so this is happening but why is this happening and and how can we avoid this uh, it is painful for me to see my 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 husband or my wife uh, my relative to have undergone such type of misery towards the very end of life and especially the uh, there are a couple of uh, physicians who also happen to be cancer caregivers and this share our perspective uh, exactly uh, and so uh, everyone is asking about uh, why are we doing this and how can we stop up, uh, stop this and then there is another another school of thought in which uh, uh, to which I, I completely agree as well uh, in which uh, the patients and the patient advocates uh, speak about the need to uh, individualize the decision and talk to the patient and ask the patient for his or her treatment expectations, goals and tailor the treatment accordingly. It's maybe not the personalized care that we hear so much of about but it still matters. Yeah, I think uh, this should uh, be the, uh, in fact this should be the definition of precision medicine or the personalized medicine. To personalize the treatment depending on the patient's goals and needs and side effects and uh, uh, yeah, instead of the, what, uh, instead of the common definition of precision medicine that we have been hearing, I think this is the true precision or personalized medicine.